depression, OCD, and, and obesity, the drive to eat, it can all be modulated and they're all housed near each other. That speaks to uh, what they are, is, is an imbalance of the emotional drive with the ability for the frontal lobes to tamp down some of these instincts. It's instinctive to eat. Sometimes it can feel instinctive to be depressed. And sometimes uh, obsessive compulsion is, is a part of our brain and it's, it's a natural part of our brain. It, it's okay to have those feelings. When you have them too much, the imbalance isn't just electrochemical and those emotional hubs. It's, a, it's the frontal lobes not accessing uh, their potential to tamp down some of the emotions. Anything difficult where you have to think is good for your brain. If you ask Usain Bolt, how do I get stronger legs to run? It, it's intuitive. But the flesh in our skulls, it's meant to think and feel. And that is the power of self-growth. And it's a thinking machine, it's a thinking flesh that you actually have to use or to protect itself because it's an energy hog, right? It's three pounds, but uses 20%. If you're not using parts of it, it'll program itself to let those parts of the garden wither. Mm. So the diversity of thinking and the depth of thinking just one level past what you're used to is the way to keep the whole garden flourishing. And it is a garden in there. There's chemicals, there are things moving, there are different types of brain cells. It's not just neurons. So I always try to give that metaphor analogy, if you will, that it's a garden and you have to irrigate it and stimulate and tend to all the corners, particularly the ones you're starting to neglect. Maybe it's your left hand. Getting out of the box and engaging the recesses of your mind is the most important thing. And then you have the, then the, then the creative things happen. You don't just sit down and have them happen. You got to work and dream and go hard. And on top of that, something creative can happen. Mm. So is there a specific protocol? Like I know people have said, brush your teeth with your left hand, or one of the coolest things I've ever heard about staving off dementia mm -hmm. is to take dance class because mm -hmm. having to um, do bodily movements, mm -hmm. but in a particular rhythm and learning new steps is like sort of the ultimate trifecta for keeping the brain young. Are there things like that? Because people listening right now, yep. they want to write something down. Step one, okay. do this. Step two, do this. So now we have the understanding that the brain is meant to think. The brain is also meant to command your body to move. And absolutely, the minute you don't use your left hand, the right parietal lobe with the motor strip says, I'm not getting used much. I'll shave down that, I'll shave down that density of those brain cells a little bit. So that's where movement's important. So simple things like getting the mouse, you know, using the mouse with your left hand and using your phone with your left hand. Mm -hmm. It's a powerful technique. And then the other thing is navigation. When you see old people and they lose their way home, well, that has a particular address also. Many things are global in the brain, but navigation is in the temporal lobe and they have dementia in that area. Navigation also is uh, spatial awareness is a function of the brain. And sometimes when we're on our phones too much, we don't have that. So my kids, I tell them, don't look down, not religiously or adamantly, but try to just remember our route and just look up and see how, see how far you can get. Uh, I think those habits will help us as we get less young. And those are practical things we can do during the day. And as far as the, uh, the other element is brain training. It, it doesn't have to be some weird game that's not intuitive. I think brain training just means learning as a habit, mm. one step past where you're comfortable. If you're reading it, you know it, your brain's an, it's an idol. If it's too hard, it's not even engaged. It's, it's, I'm, not, I'm not even gonna win this race. I'm not gonna kick in a second gear. So just, just like video games, just good enough to get to the next level, right? They don't hit you with the fifth level, the tilt level up front. It's level one to level two, level two to level three. And that's what learning is. So despite your knowledge and intellect, it's just that level right beyond you that is brain training. So you don't have to buy an app. You just have to challenge yourself and think. The sleep disruption can be quite difficult on the brain. Even if you can get a few hours of sleep, don't do it. Really? Yeah. Disrupted what? sleep as residents and people can write in we if you can just get an hour or two sometimes it's better to stay up the whole night and it's a story well worn between residents they pass that on to each other and the reason is the sleep disruption can be quite difficult on the brain and so if you're going to get five good hours of sleep going on to people who aren't in surgical training maybe that's better than seven hours of disrupted sleep where your phone is going off 
and different things are pinging your way. So that's one lesson I think people should understand. Let's talk about the mind diet. Yeah. I found that really interesting in the book. Yeah, that's well known. So this is not to lose weight. It's what nutrients to put inside you where if you have a thousand people here and you have a thousand people here and for 20 years they eat differently, what are the numbers of people with dementia, mm -hmm. all of the things being equal? It essentially says, uh, it doesn't have to be Mediterranean. It just has to be plants, like as I tell my kids, plants, which is, you know, fruit or salad. It doesn't have to be just salad. You know, yogurt, nuts, lean meats, like, you know, chicken and salmon. What it's is the, it that salmon has? Omega-3s. It's the only thing in our literature that we know is a, is a nutritional component in food that is good for brain health. And the omega-3s are a unique type of fat that are, you know, the brain is an extremely fatty organ. And so it needs to, it needs to have those fats. So omega-3s uh, are the only things nutritionally that I would say is you could supplement or actually add salmon in a couple times a week. So that's the mind diet twist on the heart diet by adding a little bit more emphasis on salmon. What you can't have is a lot of fried processed food. And if you have a cheat day or whatever, you have a burger, it doesn't negate what you've done. I think that's the hardest thing about dieting for people. They feel like the shift has to be complete and religious. And to me, it's more glacial because the benefits will also take decades to accrue. You know, that's my, that's my, you know, those are the nutrients that are best for the brain. You talked about intermittent fasting in the book. What do you think about that? What is its impact on the mind, longevity? Um, what's its place? So if you want to kick the mind diet into next year, and you're thinking, I don't want to just stave off brain degeneration, right? Like, what if you wanted to work on focus and cognition? These things are harder to test, but when you go into the big neuroscience journals, they speak about intermittent fasting. And the best way I can explain it is your brain's a hybrid vehicle. It grew, it evolved through, through thousands and thousands and thousands of years of lots of food scarcity. You didn't eat all the time. And so it's got a backup mechanism called ketone. So after 16 hours, if you don't put glucose in and the liver's done the releasing the glucose it's held onto through glycogen reserves, then it'll start burning fat. It'll clip off those oxygens and hydrogens and they'll make ketones out of it. Intermittent fasting can also help you lose weight. I think that's why most people are interested in it. But it's the way the brain prefers to get its fuel source. So that's proof that food changes mind because the mind is the electricity sparking through that flesh. Mm -hmm. Food will change the electricity, detectable, measurable det electricity in your brain. With that premise, we can talk about, okay, mind diet will hold off dementia and intermittent fasting might make you feel like you've had a cup of coffee once you get in a rhythm. It's not gonna make you smarter, but it'll bring you to your most focused, to bring you to your most attentive. A bit of food scarcity can actually sharpen your mind. You were born with more brain cells than uh, as a kid than you are as an adult. And because we're losing them slowly over time? You were equipped with a lot that we can't hold on to. Uh, you're going to reinforce the ones that you're using and the ones you don't use, your brain will say, I don't need to hold on to them because they're just using energy. But the, the plasticity is we start off with more brain cells than we hold on to, yet we get smarter as, than when we are, when we, mm. for the most part, when we are from our, as kids. And we get more coordinated as we lose brain cells. Their, their exam, that's the example that shows you that uh, it's about the connections and reinforcing those mm -hmm. patterns. Depression, OCD, and, and obesity, the drive to eat, it can all be modulated and they're all housed near each other. That speaks to uh, what they are, is, is an imbalance of the emotional drive with the ability for the frontal lobes to tamp down some of these instincts. It's instinctive to eat. Sometimes it can feel instinctive to be depressed and sometimes uh, obsessive compulsion is, is a part of our brain and it's, it's a natural part of our brain. It, it's okay to have those feelings. When you have them too much, the imbalance isn't just electrochemical in those emotional hubs. It's, a, it's the frontal lobes not accessing uh, their potential to tamp down some of the emotions. Thinking of creating new habits uh, creating new values, 
uh, creating less triggers in your life, that's the opportunity that we all have. The frontal lobe regulation of how we feel is in your own command. And you've seen it in Buddhist monks, you've seen the mind-body connection in deep divers. There's actually two nerves that come down and wrap around the heart. They can think down their pulse. They can think down how fast their heart beats. This is not like baloney. This is, you can put an ultrasound, we can, you can look it up online, you see videos of it. That shows that thinking can change thought can change how fast your heart beats? Why wouldn't we believe that thought can change those subcortical structures about anxiety and depression? So the, the question is repetition. And I agree, it's not thinking about the mountaintop. You can, by the way you breathe, you can change the electricity in your mind. We've seen that with the people we put grids on. Like we have actual measurements now, but that's the, you know, what's the structure where you get the most out of repetition? What is the perfect spot where uh, meditative breathing hits that sweet spot for people? And they'll increase it if it continues to benefit them. But the food, the breathing, sleep is a hard one, but to me, um, food, what we eat, and meditative breathing, I think are the most uh, graspable and measurable. Uh, the creativity stuff, the sleep stuff, uh, the exercise stuff is harder for people, uh, but the exercise stuff is in its way, own way the most important if we can get back to that. Ooh, why? Keeps your brain arteries open, releases all these neurotrophic factors inside your brain. So not just the plumbing that irrigates the flesh of the brain. Tell me about but BDNF. Actually, yeah, they're nerve growth factors. They're all okay. neurotrophic factors. and the, Whatever the, the for the in this case to be abbreviations GDNF BDNF NGF it doesn't matter they end with GF <laughs> and growth factors so it really is I've heard your word miracle grow but getting back to the garden uh, analogy uh, to keep the flesh we're gonna get you know electricity is one thing to keep the flesh healthy uh, you have to irrigate it and that has to do with your brain arteries and. Since we already said it's not a it's not a ball, you know, it's these uh, you know these uh, jellyfish and they're moving and they're throbbing and they're pulsating and their tentacles are reaching out. There's a lot of space in between, and that extracellular space outside of the actual cells, outside of the neurons, outside of the jellyfish, if you will, it's not just water. There's chemicals floating around in there. Now, dopamine might be just from tentacle to tentacle, you know. Serotonin might be this way, but what's it? What's in all the stuff around all those billions and billions of neurons? They're growth factors and minerals and chemicals that the brain naturally has. But there's also a soup that these billions and billions of neurons are floating in. BDNF is a key component of that soup that helps regulate the health of each of those uh, jellyfish or neurons. And we can trigger more of that through yeah. exercise. Yeah, you exercise and it releases it, it showers itself. It's not like the thighs, thigh muscle sends it up to the brain. The brain says, hey, I'm feeling good. This is good. I like this. I'm going to create a new rut. I'm going to remind you, you feel good when you run. The brain will shower itself with growth factors. There are growth factors. The brain says, hey, you know, the electrochemical balance is better with those. So I think that's where you get the runner's high. You know, it's not just adrenaline. It's not dopamine is a happy chemical. I'm jacked up. I'm on adrenaline. It's just such a complex ecosystem and rather than feeling um, intimidated by that to me I just see opportunities on how people can you know improve their lives